Hey guys, welcome to Chapel. Um, today we have a really cool guest speaker. Um, her name is Kendra Burkheis. She's from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and she actually went to South Christian. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, she's here with her three kids and her husband, and she's the author of a book called Here Goes Nothing. And she's gonna teach us a little bit more about how to love our neighbor today. So please help me welcome her. Hello. Should have figured this out before. Sorry about that. Put this on before. Okay. It is such a pleasure to be back here. Thanks for so much for having me. Um, as Ray New already mentioned, my name is Kendra Brookheis. Um, I went to South 10 years ago, which seems like a long time right now, looking at your bright young faces. <laughs> so since I graduated, um, I went to Dort College out in Iowa for four years, lived in Guatemala for three years, went to the south side of Chicago for two years, and now I've been living in Milwaukee for one year. So um, I made my husband promise that we would not move for another 10 years. <laughs> um, but anyways, I, I thought I'd start out my chat this morning by saying hello, giving a little tweet out to some of the teachers that I had um, about 10 years ago. So let's see here. Um, hey, Mr. DeWeird, are you? Hey. Um, <laughs> I hope this speech isn't as boring as reading The Old Man in the Sea. <laughs> Hashtag JK. <laughs> Hashtag classic lit is totally lit. <laughs> um, hey, Ms. DeVries, would you be mad if I admitted that 10 years ago I signed up for library duty just so that I could sit and talk to my boyfriend during study hall? Hashtag thug life. <laughs> um, what's up, Mrs. Mrs. Gitchelar? Um, just want to let you know that my hips no longer run seven minute miles, or really any miles for that matter. Hashtag who run the world, hashtag not this girl. <laughs> um, Mr. Borsma, uh, what did the Atlantic Ocean say to the Pacific Ocean? Nothing, it just waved. <laughs> hashtag social studies jokes are so outdated. Hashtag oops, I did it again. <laughs> Um, Mr. Grimm, I passed health class, but our first kid was a surprise, so it might be time to revamp your curriculum. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> Hashtag not in front of the children. <laughs> Mrs. Hogsma and Mr. Wallstra and Mr. Jagger, I married a science teacher, and on what was supposed to be our romantic vacation, he made me chase a trail of ants through the forest, fill them with my camera, and pretend to narrate them for National Geographic. So, unlike you guys, some science teachers are big nerds. <laughs> Hashtag, but he didn't make me build a cell out of jello. <laughs> Mr. Hiskis, I voted third party in the last presidential election, so now I'm pretty sure I know how you feel every season you cheer for the fighting Illini. Oh. <laughs> Hashtag, oh no, she didn't. <laughs> Mr. Huttinga, most people don't know what movie I'm quoting when I say, the people, the people. Hashtag, Sybil still haunts my dreams. Um, Mr. Pothoven, I give you credit for my success as a writer because my haiku poem made it into your haiku hall of fame. Hashtag, going places. Senora Versluz, que Dios la bendiga. Hashtag, Spanish. <laughs> And Mr. Spring Blue Van Hoogle, Woven, Huckstra, Meadaba, and Mrs. Mahitsma, and any others I might be missing. Hashtag, hey. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get to it. <laughs> so this morning, I'm going to talk about a little bit what it means to love strangers. I used to think that the only meaning of the word strangers was someone I didn't know who lived in poverty in a foreign place. So with this in mind, I love the idea of loving strangers. And as I was in high school, my plan was to just skip college and go straight to the mission field. And while the Lord added a few steps to that plan, including going to college and getting married, I eventually moved to Guatemala to work as a teacher in a small Christian school. And after we lived there for a while, there were a couple poor strangers who came to our door quite often. One was a man named Victor, whose job was to sell orange juice at our bus stop. And another was a woman who we think was named Alejandra, <laughs> and she usually had a baby tied to her back and a toddler holding her hand. 
They usually ask for food or for milk for their children or for money for medicine. And at first, it was exciting each time these strangers came to our door. It felt like we were opening the door to an exotic creature that we could feed and then feel good about ourselves. But in my quest to learn about what it meant to love strangers overseas, we realized that we were also strangers. While we knew quite a bit of Spanish, we weren't fluent enough to communicate our deeper thoughts. My husband Colin's body reacted so badly to some of the strange food that we ate that he got E. coli and lost 20 pounds the first couple months that we lived there. And in a different culture, it was hard to feel like we were really connected to our church community. Being around so many things that were foreign to us and being foreigners ourselves, we were really challenged and we were really changed. So much so that when we went home to visit our family and friends in the States over Christmas and during the summer, we realized that through our culture shock that we had been changed a lot too. And that there were ways that we felt out of place and that we didn't fit in. And so we love Guatemala, but we were still outsiders. And although the United States was familiar, there were ways that we felt like we didn't fit in and that we just weren't quite at home. So either creating space for strangers in your life or being the stranger will stretch you in ways that feel really uncomfortable. At times, it will make you feel lonely and frustrated, and it will make you depend on God more than you've ever had to before. And it will also help you realize some of the most important reasons why we should learn to love other strangers. And I believe that one of those reasons is that we are all strangers in some way. Now, some of you might understand when I say that. Maybe you understand the feeling of being the stranger or feeling like you don't fit in. Honestly, being here brings back some of my own feelings sitting in these, uh, when I was sitting in these chairs. I played a couple sports and I had some really wonderful friends, but I also struggled with a lot of insecurities about who I was and if I was uh, good enough, popular enough, pretty enough. So maybe you're sitting here today and you feel really comfortable with the world that you're in, or maybe you feel like the most awkward misfit. But the truth is we are all strangers and Christ chose to love us anyway. Ephesians 2 verse 19 says, For through him, that is Christ, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. And so now the crazy thing is that when we become Christians and we are no longer strangers to God's love, we become strangers to the world. Because God calls us to really weird ways of loving people. And in the ways that he commands us to love other people. And so I thought about this command a lot when we moved back from, the United, uh, back from Guatemala to the United States. Um, Kyle and I really wanted our experiences overseas to transform our lives as a family when we moved back here. So we asked our friends for advice on, on how we could do this. They had been missionaries in Guatemala, but they had also spent 19 years living on some of the most dangerous streets of Los Angeles. So they knew a thing or two about loving strangers. And so when we asked them, what can we do to live out our Christian faith as a family, they told us this, get to know your neighbors. Now, maybe that seems like a really simple thing to do, but it turns out that roughly one-third of Americans have never even interacted with their next-door neighbors, let alone their, learn their names or spend any time with them. So I decided to do a 30-day challenge. My goal was each day to recognize the ways that God was saying I love you to me in my everyday life and in turn recognize opportunities to share that message with my neighbors. So during the first couple days of this challenge, I started with anonymous acts of kindness in our apartment building. I had random thoughts cross my mind like, hey, you should pay for someone's laundry and hey, you should make some cupcakes for your neighbor. And so instead of dismissing these as random thoughts, I decided to actually do them. So we, have a, we had a community laundry room um, where we did coin laundry. So I stuck some quarters in the laundry machine and left a little Tide detergent pod for our neighbors. Um, the next day, I made a batch of cupcakes that I left outside the door of the neighbor who lives below us. And part of me thought, wow, these are such great ideas. And the other part of me thought, you idiot. Who is going to eat cupcakes that are left outside their door by an anonymous stranger? <laughs> this is the south side of Chicago, not Grand Rapids, Michigan. <laughs> so by the end of day two, both the quarters and the cupcakes were left unnoticed, and I felt really dumb about it. I ran up and down our stairs, 
a ton of times between the laundry room and our neighbor's um, apartment and our apartment on the third floor, and nothing changed. And I wondered if this whole idea was a bust. But here's the thing that we need to remember whenever we are attempting to love our neighbors or other strangers in our lives. That when we do these actions out of faith, faith does not worry about being a success or a failure. Instead, faith simply acts in obedience and trusts God to take care of the rest. So throughout these 30 days, I spent time with one of our neighbors more than others. Her name is Joan, and she is a sweet, sarcastic little old woman who lived on the first floor. So Joan and I ate lunch together. We watched Steve Harvey together. We went from being complete strangers to friends. And my friendship with Joan made me think really hard about who God has placed in my life for a reason. Joan told me that she didn't have a car, so she had to wait to get groceries until her son or daughter could take her. She told me that it was nice when, she, when we spent time chatting because sometimes she went a whole week without talking to anybody. But I had a car, and I could grab some groceries for Joan, and I stayed home with my daughter, so I had time that we could watch Steve Harvey together. <laughs> so sometimes the strangers that God commands us to love are people in faraway lands. But what I learned when we moved back to the States is that sometimes strangers are people in our everyday lives that we choose not to know. And loving these kinds of strangers requires praying for God to open our eyes to see who he's placed in our lives for a reason. It takes remembering that the command to love our neighbors as ourselves means living a life connected with other people, even strangers. And it takes learning to fend off whatever gets in the way of that kind of connection. And I'll be honest, I am really good at coming up with reasons why I don't need to think about the strangers in my everyday life. Like the fact that I recharge my energy by being alone. So when someone asks me to give up a lot of my time, sometimes that makes me feel really bitter. <laughs> I mentioned that at first it was really fun to spend time and feed our poor friends in Guatemala, but then our doorbell kept ringing at 9.30 p.m. and it wasn't that fun anymore which I realize that makes me sound really old, but sometimes, someday you guys will understand why 9.30 is really late. <laughs> and if I'm totally honest, I'd rather sit on the couch connecting on social media instead of with the people that I share my real life with. I would m rather say that I'm too busy and binge watch Netflix. And other times I've avoided people because I was afraid of feeling awkward. Being around new people and in new situations feels uncomfortable for many. But one thing that God kept pounding into my head during these 30 days was that he calls me to a life that lives for the sake of the gospel, not for the sake of my own comfort. If there is one idol that I, can, that I am so tired of <laughs> in my own life and that I can warn you about as you grow in your Christian faith, it is the idol of comfort. You will be told over and over that your number one priority in life is your comfort. And that comfort can be found through a big paycheck or a gated neighborhood or a high level degree or a whole lot of different things. And sadly, sometimes you'll even be told that by people in the church, not just by people who aren't Christians. But here is the deal. While there's nothing wrong with getting a big paycheck <laughs> and a high level degree, the safest way for you to live your life is to follow where God is leading you to go. If he puts a strong desire in your heart to become a doctor in the suburbs, then for heaven's sake, do not move to a poor village in Uganda <laughs> just because you want, are in search of danger. And if your strong heart's desire is to become a teacher in the mountains of Guatemala, then do not let your aunt keep you from going there because she thinks it might be dangerous. <laughs> Jesus does not tell us to follow either danger or safety he tells us in Matthew to follow him. He said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Now, I can't, tell, I can't stand here and tell you that there is no danger involved in loving people that you don't know. I can't tell you that you won't get hurt or that you'll never feel uncomfortable. All I can tell you is that loving our neighbors means more than studying the Bible's commands. It means doing them. 
It means more than wearing Christian words on our t-shirts and putting a hashtag blessed next to our pictures on Instagram. I attend Bible study at the church that we go to in downtown Milwaukee. And one time after class, I walked out of our building and I saw this man sleeping outside on the patio chair. And the first thing that came to my mind was, crap, there's a homeless guy. (laughs) Now, I had a lot of errands to run that day, but I knew that if I was leaving a Bible study about God's love, that I probably shouldn't ignore the homeless man sitting right outside our church's building. So I stopped and I kind of awkwardly hovered around him a little bit, wondering if I should try to wake him up at all. But I thought that maybe if he had to choose between sleep and food, that he'd want some food. So the one thing that I did not learn in Sunday school was how to wake up a sleeping homeless man. (laughs) I am not a morning person, so I knew that maybe if I woke him up, he might want to punch me in the face. (laughs) So I shielded my two kids behind my legs, and I leaned forward as far as I could with my go-go gadget arms, (laughs) which is perks of being a tall, gangly person. (laughs) And I poked him on the shoulder. And luckily, he came to very slowly with no sudden movements. (laughs) And we ended up spending some time with him. We, We went across the street, Um, to get some groceries uh, at the store for him and for us. And then I asked him all these questions. I asked, you know, do you want to come over to our house, to our apartment and eat lunch? Um, You know, do you want to take a shower? Do you want a pair of my husband's pants? And he said, no, I will not take your husband's pants before I meet him. (laughs) Which I thought, wow, you are so polite. (laughs) But he finally agreed to let us pick him up later in the afternoon and eat supper at our house. And during these hours before supper, I felt really nervous because what are you supposed to talk about with someone who has lived a life completely different than you? I worried that there would be a lot of awkward silence and that we would feel really uncomfortable and that we wouldn't know what to say. And yet through the Lord's provision, from the moment I picked him up to the time that Colin drove him back to where he wanted to go that night, the guy did not shut up. (laughs) So I'm telling you, this man was a philosopher, He was a poet, he was a politician, and all he needed was someone who was willing to listen, which we tried our best. So we gave him food. This time, um, he did accept my husband's extra pair of pants. (laughs) And for a couple hours, we gave him a place to belong. And even though it felt a little awkward at times, we tried our best to love the stranger that we crossed paths with that day. Hebrews 13 tells us to not neglect showing hospitality to strangers. Matthew 25 tells us that when we feed, clothe, welcome, and visit strangers in prison, it is as if we are feeding, clothing, welcoming, and visiting Christ himself. And knowing how passionately Christ feels about strangers means we should learn to do the same. We can be someone that invites everyone. We can be a good listener. We can do our work well, knowing that whatever kind of job we do is really a bridge that connects us with other people and gives us a chance to show them God's love. Last October, I was on the receiving end of this kind of love. I was traveling with our two kids, and I took a ferry across Lake Michigan from um, Milwaukee to Muskegon. And the moment that we made it out of the channel and into the water, I knew our trip was not going to end well. The waves were rocking the boat side to side and front to back. And in third grade, I threw up riding the bus to school. (laughs) So yeah, I knew it was not going to be good. We managed fine for about an hour, but then Jocelyn, my three-year-old, she put down her coloring book, and she curled up beside me in her chair, and she started singing praise songs. And I thought, oh, it is just like Paul and Silas in prison, praising Jesus through her suffering. (laughs) But then she started singing, I will make you fishers of men. And I thought, no, 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 Lord, please do not take that literally. (laughs) And then our son, who was just a couple months old at the time, um, he started getting feverish and he started to cry. And I couldn't walk him around because the boat was rocking too much. And so I looked around for help and there was no one there. And of course, I definitely had to throw up at this point. I felt so much anxiety about our, about our circumstances and just everything was out of my control at this point that I had a legit panic attack. My fingers and my hands were cramped so much like this that I could not move them. <laughs> I could not wipe my sweaty face. I could not hold my baby. I couldn't do anything. 
And so I finally yelled at the passenger nearby to ask if he could find some crew members who could help us. And so he gets up, runs, almost biffs it because the boat is still rocking at this point. <laughs> but just a few minutes later, I was completely surrounded by crew members. One took our son and cuddled him until she calmed him down completely. Another came over to sit by our daughter and entertain her. And another came and gave me some water so that my muscles would stop cramping. And then I realized that my kids were being taken care of. So I finally felt like I had permission to just relax and throw up. <laughs> and so I felt so much better, but I also felt so humiliated because um, two other crewmen led me outside of the boat where I sat the remainder of the ride in the cold rain wearing a huge rubber poncho. <laughs> One was even nice enough to say to me, don't be embarrassed, you'd be amazed at how often this happens. <laughs> I could tell he was lying. <laughs> so the moral of my story is that you should never take the ferry across Lake Michigan in October. But please also remember that loving strangers means noticing the people right in front of us. Yes, those crew members were definitely paid to do their job that day, <laughs> but it is very easy to tell when someone is doing something because deep down, they also really care. So as you leave here today, I want you to think about the strangers that God has placed in your life for a reason. They might be people in the same class as you, people some of you meet when you go to college next year, people in faraway lands, or people right here in your own neighborhoods. And I want you to pray to recognize ways that you can radically welcome them into your lives and show them Christ's love. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, please open our eyes to see the strangers that you have placed in our lives for a reason. Please give us courage to step outside of ourselves and our own comfort in order to love them. Thank you for showing us that you loved us first even when we were strangers. In your name, amen. Thank you so much.